Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk here. Uh, this is a work which uh, we have been doing since last one year, and in collaboration with my uh, supervisor in Cambridge, with whom I was a student earlier and, and postdoc with, Peter Davidson, and now we are uh, collaborating with Oli Christensen and Johannes in Max Planck Institute of Social Sciences in, in Göttingen. And what I've been trying to do for last six, seven months is uh, taking the head of Sherlock Holmes and take a magnifying glass, uh, which you can see here, and sort of hunt or look for inertial waves in big uh, dynamo uh, simulations. So basically, we are, trying to, we are going to move from the ocean, which Mani talked about, uh, to the deep earth, deep core of the earth. So if you look at this picture here, uh, that's the inner core of the earth, that's the outer core of the earth, and between that, we have a liquid iron, which is very, very hot. And in school, we were taught that uh, there's a big bar magnet in the core of the earth, and perhaps that creates a magnetic field. But it's, it's totally, it's, it's untrue. And I was surprised when I, I thought, I, I came to know about this very late. Uh, the, the problem is that at this temperature, the temperature here is roughly between 5,700 to, so let's say, approximately 4,000 on an average. And beyond 1,000 Kelvin, iron loses its magnetic properties. That's the Curie temperature. So it's different some, something else which creates a magnetic field. So what exactly it is, that's the question which has been bothering people for quite some time. And one of the ideas is that somehow the motion of the fluid in this part, in the outer core, creates the magnetic field. And the motion is sub, said to be very turbulent and chaotic. But the magnetic field, sub, surprisingly, is very regular and organized, as, we, as you all know. You have a distinct North Pole and a South Pole, which are approximately co coincides with the ge geographic uh, North Pole and South Pole. And this is, has been observed very consistently for a, a long time. Uh, and the thing is, this has not decayed. So the magnetic field is long lived, it has sustained. So how has it been sustained for a long time against the uh, dissipative decay? That's the question which people are trying to answer and that motivates a lot of research. So there have been a lot of work, especially uh, numericals and analytical work. You, you cannot, unfortunately, do experiments like you could do for atmosphere and oceans. Um, so uh, people have done some numerical simulations, and the simulations, although they are very far from the core parameter regime, they have been able to remarkably produce the dipolar North Pole and the South Pole, the uh, two poles magnetic field. And that's the part of the, there's a fluid part where you can see the, the magnetic field lines colored by the sign. Uh, and here, of course, you can see this is not something very clear. It's very spaghetti like mixed. Uh, and this is, very, this is where the fluid motions are also very chaotic and, and unsteady. So one of the models which exists to explain this uh, magnetic field is called the alpha effect. And what it is is, if you have a, let's say if you have a start with a, a B5, a toroidal field line, and if you have a helical flow, which means the U and omega, the velocity and vorticity are parallel, that can twist the field lines in a way that you can, if you start with, yeah, you start with the B5, you can twist the field lines, uh, the field lines will, uh, they, they will detach, and that creates the other component of the magnetic field from the starting with B5. Uh, so the way it happens is you start, uh, you first generate an a anti-parallel current, and that current from Ampere's law can, should have a, a, a B theta. And same thing can repeat, and you can come back to B5. So it's a process we can explain why the magnetic field is self-sustained. I'll, I'll come back to this in more detail uh, very shortly. So the, the point is that the Flow is a, a columnar because the uh, rotation is one of the main, main forces and it constrains the flow, and it's helical. And these two are very important ingredients for a geodynamo. That's a very uh, important point to remember for this talk as well. So let's go in a little bit of detail. Although it's not very important for the results that I'll talk about, just to uh, give you some ideas and uh, to start with some, some basics, uh, Ampere's law, Faraday's, Ohm's law, uh, conservation of charge, solenoidal B. So I talk about alpha effect. So let's say we start with a polaroidal B. So this is a radial plus Z. So what happens is that this with the alpha effect acts on this, this uh, let's say this, this part. It creates, uh, because the helicity in the north, if it is negative, it will generate a parallel current. So this is anti-clock, anti-clock, so anti-clock. And because the helicity is positive, this is anti-parallel. Remember in the last slide, parallel U and B generated an anti-parallel J and B. So if this was anti-parallel, this J and B would be parallel. This is what is shown here. Uh, so let's say if you look at this part now, this is clockwise, and with the negative helicity, J 
generates a clockwise here and uh, anti-clockwise here. And then this, from MPS law, it should have a current loop like this, which is the V theta. And then the alpha effect can, can act back on this law, uh, this, this field, to get back from where we started. We started with this, the MPS law, we, have, we got this kind of field line. It's basically a cycle which can self-sustain. Uh, so that's a very interesting observation. The, the, the point is, is this true for the core or not? That's a sort of a point of a, a constraint and it's quite a, a debatable in argument. Uh, a lot of people do arguments over that. It's not the case and something else happens. So this is another equation which is important now, apart from the hydrodynamic, the kind of strokes and the other equation we have been looking at. Uh, so if you start with this Ohm's law, take a curl, that's a uh, curl of J, and uh, that's this curl of E. So curl of E will be, you can get replace that by dbdt, which is this term, and curl of u cross b is that term, the nonlinear term, and the curl of j will be curl of curl of b, and that using the Soren Ordel condition, you can end up with this term. So this remarkably looks very much like the vorticity equation, if you remember it. Uh, so this is a nonlinear part, uh, that's a dissipative like like part, and that's your temporal uh, variation. Uh, so there's there are a lot of analogies. In fact. Uh, uh, People look at Kelvin's circulation theorem and compare the two cases, this and vorticity, and uh, they say that this magnetic field is frozen into the field lines. But the difference is, this B, unlike in vorticity, this is that is curl of U, but that is not a curl of something. So it's not exactly analogous. One has to be very, very careful when making the analogy. So moving to the uh, the work now. So so given the flow is helical, people have people that we know why the magnetic field will sustain. And indeed the flow is found to be very helical and especially the helicity is the ne negative in the north and positive in the south in the dynamo simulations. So that's a very robust feature of a lot of dynamo simulations. But where is this helicity comes from is an open question. No one exactly understands how. And we have been indeed, indeed looking at this uh, for, for a while. I'm not going to talk about that part of the work today. Uh, what I'm talking about is one possible candidate for giving the helicity. So one of those candidates is inertial wave. So the title was the uh, internally delivered inertial waves. Let's come back to inertial waves and talk about in, uh, in a bit, bit of de detail. So in my PhD, I, what I had is a very simple setting, periodic box with a parallel uh, omega vertical and gravity in this direction along y. It is inspired by the equatorial regions in the core where omega and g are almost perpendicular. And if we start with this layer of buoyancy and apply its rapid rotation, we see columns coming out of the, the layer of buoyancy. And if you color the columns by helicity, what we see is a very clear negative above and positive below. So, and that turns out to be a very interesting characteristic of inertial waves. I'll come back come to this in a moment. So the thing is, if this is important for a periodic box, can this be important for the core of the Earth? It's very difficult, actually, because here's it's very simplified. This is a, a single slice. We have periodic boundaries. We don't have any magnetic field. Whereas in the core of the earth, we have everything, spherical boundary, magnetic field, and still we have this negative above and positive below helicity. So it's very hard to say that this is exactly applicable here, but I mean, it's quite interesting and to make the analogy and, in fact, even the flow, if you look at the flow here, is uh, the, this is UZ, it shows negative, positive, negative, positive UZ, alternate cyclones and anticyclones. And that's exactly what is observed even in the, the uh, velocity field in, in, the, in the simulations. But a lot of qualitative uh, analogies, but very uh, strong uh, differences in the type of uh, flows and uh, the type of forces mainly, mainly. So the question is, are there any inertial waves even present in simulations? Can we talk of even, I mean, are they even there here? And if they are, yes, then how can we detect them? What can we do to uh, find the signature of those waves, if I can use that term? So the idea of flow, uh, columnar flow, is not at all new. Uh, the, one of the pioneer scientists, Pusa, he predicts that the flow is at the onset of convection. The flow is, uh, it is likely to be very columnar, and it is like a columnar role which extends from one part of the, uh, the boundary. It's called a mantle core mantle boundary from here to here. Uh, but he assumes a very negligible time dependence on the velocity field. That's a very important assumption to reach this conclusion. Uh, but in the core of the Earth, and even in the dynamo simulations, some of the recent ones, the flow is highly, highly unsteady. It's highly convective, supercritical. Uh, so this is like 300 times supercritical, and the flow is columnar in Z, but it's not at all a roll-like. It's more plume-like or sheet-like. So we see that this assumption is not likely to really work 
for the core of the earth and even in some strongly forced uh, simulations. So the question is how is the coherence of the columns maintained under such uh, strong uh, thermal forcing? So we think it could be because of internally driven low frequency inertial waves. And since columnar fl flow is important for magnetism, indirectly the inertial waves could be very important for magnetism. So a little bit about inertial waves just uh, to recap. Uh, People are familiar with the Taylor column formation. Uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon which has fascinated me for, uh, for a long time. And, uh, but this is a very specific case, one has to remember it. Uh, if you start with the navier stokes equation in the rapid, rapid rotation and inviscid limit and take a curl, and then if you say uh, the d omega dt is zero under quasi uh, steady conditions, then that gives you a zero. And that is basically d, duz dz or du dz is zero. It means there's no variation of the flow in the, uh, this column parallel to the uh, this solid body. So what it means is the flow is always, the flow in this particular part of the object doesn't uh, communicate much with the rest of the fluid. So when you move this object in a tank, the flow, the column above this object moves with it. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So it acts as if it was a rigid column, where, which, is, which actually it is not. What happens is the flow actually moves around the column you put a die here and, and allow it to move across the, this column here. So the other way to explain this is uh, through inertial waves. So if, you, if you take a curl of the t by dt, you end up with a wave equation, and uh, that's the equation for the inertial waves. And so that, what happens is this object radiates inertial waves, and this, those waves <coughs> travel vertically, especially the low frequency waves, they travel vertically above, and they reflect back from here, come, come here. So they sort of lock the information inside this fluid column. That's how, that's the mechanism of a formation of a tail column. Uh, and because they are low frequency, you can say that this is like a, this is zero. So it is basically talking about this in, in a sense. So, the, but the more interesting problem uh, for, for geophysical application, let us say, is uh, a problem with a localized blob or localized disturbance. So in this case, there's no boundary. Here, we had a boundary. We could put boundary condition on this equation and solve it. What, if you start with the initial disturbance, let's say a Gaussian eddy, that's the initial value problem. So now you have, a, at t equal to zero, you have some velocity disturbance, and you can solve some equations, in, and you can get some analytical solutions as well. And so let's say if you start with the Gaussian eddy, what happens is at later times, you see that the, the energy propagates preferentially along the z-axis. And that's a very interesting form, uh, observation, because this is also like a column. But is that column exactly the same as this column? It's in some ways, but very different in some other ways, because this is uh, fluid, or basically initial wave as well. But this is this comes out from a fluid disturbance, not from a solid body. So, yes. You mean here? Here? Yeah. So you mean that if there's a solid body here uh, and there's a density? So the density. Yeah, so the, the density, if there are any instabilities, local instabilities, they are also have potential to radiate inertial waves. So that will interfere with this propagation of formation of Taylor column. So I think what you, I'll probably come to that, some, something similar to that, what you're talking about. What if we have a density? So, so if you have stratification, that's the different scenario, and you have inertial gravity waves, which I think Mani was talking about. If you don't have any certification, or let's say if you're talking about a convectively unstable type of system, it's a very different. So it changes, the dynamics changes a lot. So in fact, if you, even if you look at the equation of the waves, if you have an additional term here, that is not going to give you the same equation exactly here. There will be an additional term here as well. Let us, since you talk about it, it's very uh, opportune. So here, now we have tough, we're talking about a Boosinex fluid. We have a, a temperature, so we, this could be a, some kind of a localized uh, temperature disturbance. So this is, and there's a fluctuation over the reference. And now if we take the curl, you end up with an extra term. Right? But remember this extra term is not dependent on the velocity field. So this is like a source term in the equation, basically a source. And if you think in terms of waves, that extra term is basically a source of inertial waves. So you can again uh, do the same thing and derive the equation for the inertial waves. And if you assume that E dt of dt, a small variation in, in the fluctuation, this is like a source term. It looks like very complicated, but it's not so difficult to calculate, actually. So if you just look at the z component of this, this equation, just to uh, have some physical understanding. So 
So this DTD file, I'm assuming the gravity to be in a radial direction. So uh, this is like a cylindrical polar, so uh, S phi Z. So this is perpendicular to the direction of, uh, the gradient perpendicular to the direction of gravity. That's like a source of inertial risk, like a source of vorticity as well. And it's also a source of inertial risk because a similar term appears in the wave equation as well. So it turns out this is a very, very important uh, quantity, the DT D phi. So what you, what you asked is if you had, uh, if you had like a, instead of, uh, what is it if you have one blob of fluid, uh, let's say a blob of buoyancy, that can also generate inertial waves and make columnar structures. But if you had another blob of buoyancy here, that will generate some other waves and it will interfere with the, this column and it will completely dis distract. So in, in fact, this is what exactly makes the problem very difficult to really look for the uh, inertial waves in the core of the Earth because you have buoyancy distributions everywhere almost. You have some more at the equator, but you have almost, uh, so this, it makes the problem very difficult uh, to really do. So yeah, uh, continuing the properties of inertial waves, if you uh, look at the wave equation and replace this plane wave here, you end up with a dispersion relation. It's very similar to the uh, dispersion relation that we saw for internal gravity waves. You have a uh, cos theta here instead of sine theta. So the theta is the angle between the k and the vertical omega. And the similarity again is that this doesn't ha have any k. So it means the same, the same frequency waves can have different wave numbers. So there's no uh, coupling, omega, omega k coupling. And it depends only on the, the angle between omega and k. And it varies in the range of minus plus two omega. The interesting quantity is the group velocity now. So that's the group velocity in, in three dimensions with k, uh, that's k omega cross k vectors. But if you look at the zero frequency waves, uh, or close to zero frequency waves, for which theta is almost like 90, and then CG will be vertical, that for this case, CG is just almost parallel to omega. This is omega vector, CG vector. It's almost like, almost parallel to this. That's very important for a Taylor column formation, isn't it? Or, or a column, if I don't call it a Taylor column, then it's like a column structure. So, so yeah, and then if we look at, I, I said in the previous slide that uh, this energy tends to be concentrated along the rotation axis. So why is that? Why is that the case? Let's look at it in a bit of detail. So if I'm standing here, let's see if I imagine myself sitting here, there's only one K which can give me a energy here. But if I'm here on the rotation axis, there's a whole range of horizontal K vectors which can give me a energy here. So just to repeat this point once more, if I'm, if I'm sitting here, there's just one, one, just one, one particular K number which can give me a, and send me energy here. But if I'm here, because of this, lots of Ks, in fact, there are infinite number of Ks which can send me uh, energy here. And this is one explanation why there's a strong concentration of energy on the near the vertical axis. Of course, you have other off-axis radiation, but as you can see, they are much weaker. So that's very interesting, uh, uh, actually, for, in fact, for formation of columns. It was first explained by uh, Davidson in his 2006 paper. Uh, and, then, and then if you now look at the vorticity equation, I'll just write it again uh, for reference. So that is, that's a vector. Yeah, and if I look at this equation in the Fourier space, it gives me uh, this i minus i omega times k cross u. And then if, you, if I just look at the uh, product of the amplitudes of vorticity and uh, velocity, it gives me helicity. And that is minus plus k times a positive definite quantity. What this means is, if the group velocity is positive, the helicity is negative. It just follows from this, uh, this equation. Very, very simple. It was observed by Moffett uh, uh, in his paper. And if the group velocity is negative, it means the waves are going downward, the helicity is positive. And that's what, exactly what we observe for a Gaussian eddy if we do a DNS. This is, uh, so in fact, it turns out to be a very good diagnostic to detect and say that they are really inertial waves. But then, as you said, a lot of things can make this uh, complicated can just completely distort this picture. So, yeah. Now, moving to the <coughs> real, uh, the, the full dynamo simulations. Now, these are full equations, non-dimensionalized. Uh, as the uh, Navier-Stokes induction equation, temperature, and solid model B and U. And these are the control parameters. You have a whole, whole uh, array of uh, 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 non-dimensional parameters. Uh, so, this is real numbers. Measure strength of forcing, Ekman number, parental number. The magnetic parental number now is new over the magnetic diffusivity. And these are diagnostic parameters which are uh, used to analyze the output. And this, the code solves the spherical, uh, the pseudo-spectral version of these equations. 
and we have spherical harmonics in theta and phi, and Chebyshev polynomials in R. And we have fixed temperatures on the uh, both the boundaries as a boundary condition. So a caveat before I, I talk about uh, anything else. Uh, the core parameters are much far from what we have been able to achieve in dynamic simulations. So, of course, this is not the uh, the best simulation till date. It's uh, it's quite uh, highly unsteady, as we can see from the really really critical, so 43 times supercritical. But the core the 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 core parameters are much much far. So, it's it always uh, whatever we say comes with a caveat. So, if you look at the really really critical in the uh, in the core, it's we don't know how how large it is, but it's much much larger than one. Ekman number is uh, very far from what we have been able to get. The uh, other things, sorry. the parental number is much easier compared to the others. I mean, there is much more, more well behaved. It's, it's possible to get in that regime. And that, though are, these are the other diagnostic uh, parameters. We have this, this is all the magnetic Reynolds number. Uh, this is the Rossby number, and that's the Alsacer number, which is the ratio of the Lorentz to the Coriolis uh, forces. The procedure we follow is, we run the simulation at a very high Rayleigh number and low Ekman number, and we wait for the dynamo to be established. So that is found if we see that the magnetic and kinetic energies have equilibrated, and means the production and dissipation have are now have balanced. Uh, then we say that the yeah, dynamo is established and takes about 100 advection times. Then we restart the simulation, and we run for a very short time, and with a different current condition because now we are we want to capture the the inertial waves which are very very fast, and we run for an omega t of 133 which is just 21 Earth days, if you just use the omega for the Earth. And this is very far, for, very, very fast for any, any uh, dynamo uh, person because uh, uh, they are used to uh, uh, like time scales of a decade or like a, uh, uh, maybe a year, so let's say. But uh, days are quite fast. Uh, and that's the resolution that we, uh, we get data in. And the output is in terms of R, theta, and phi. And but we trans transform this to cylindrical coordinates, S, phi, and Z because we are interested in what happens in, along the z-axis. We move from spherical to cylindrical co coordinates. And then we want to do a time series analysis. So for that, we, if we fix s and z, we get plots in phi and t. If we fix s and phi, we get plots in z and t. Okay. This is what I'll be talking about shortly. Start with the, let's just have a slice across, across the equator. This is how the, the vertical velocity looks like, and that's the temperature fluctuations, t. And as you can see, there's some radial uh, plumes coming out and flowing from the inner to the outer. These are not actually plumes because they are columnar in Z. Uh, but the most interesting aspect is if you look at uh, omega Z and DTD phi, they show a very interesting comparison. I mean, if you just look at them qualitatively, the location of the, the, and the shape of the plumes, they exactly, almost exactly match. And that's not unexpected because when we, if you remember the equation for the thermal wind, the vorticity equation, this term was definitely present in the equation. So we, we should expect this thing to happen. But it turns out that this has not been uh, really noticed by anyone uh, earlier. Quite surprising, in fact. So, so rather than looking at equatorial sizes, we should, let's move on to looking at phi z planes. So let's say for that, if we imagine that there's a cylinder with a fixed s, the cylinder extending from the top boundary to the bottom boundary, and we cut and unfold the cylinder, we see a plot like that, phi versus z. And this is similar to the plots I showed you before for the periodic boundary, periodic uh, box case. It has uh, this alternate cyclones and cyclones, minus plus, minus plus. And uh, I'm not going to show the helicity, but that also shows negative above and positive below for this case, although it's much more distorted. We can do such plots for different quantities, uz, omega z, e. And again, there's a very close correspondence between the omega z and e phi, just like we saw for the equatorial uh, slides. So the question is, what drives the columns? So our thesis, our hypothesis is that the columns are driven by the uh, temperature, the uh, gradient of temperature, dt phi, at the equator. So let's say, how do we know how, how columnar is the flow? We can define a quantity which is like the average of omega z in z and square of that divided by the square of omega z average in z. So if this quantity is 1, it means the flow is perfectly columnar. And if it is 0, it means it's not, no, not columnar at all. So what have if we do that, and if you plot this with uh, as a function of s and phi, we see that some regions are perfectly columnar, others are not so columnar. It's uh, quite a, uh, it, it varies a lot, between, uh, I think between 0.9 to 0.1 almost. But now if we do a spatial cross correlation between this and ETT phi, the source, it gives us a peak at uh, zero lag in phi and zero lag in s. That's very interesting. Because what that says is, the columns are actually sitting above the source. 
this is a, this is a very powerful, uh, powerful uh, uh, hint, if I can say that. That really, uh, the, because of the cost correlation lag, uh, lying at zero lags. Yeah. So that shows the temporary evolution of the temperature, and it's even in a very short time, it is quite dynamic. It's not static at all because of such high uh, of thermal forcing. So definitely, we should look at some closer time intervals to analyze in more detail. So to do time series, let's see. We we fix some points. So we fix S and Z, and if we fix S and Z, we end up with a phi t plot. That's basically a circle with the axis parallel to the axis of the Earth. And we can do this circle plots for various quantities, for, for t and omega z on uz and so on. But what we are really interested in is that a movement here, does it correspond to a movement here, just vertically above? And if it does, can we find a travel time estimate or time of flight estimate from by some way and compare that with some group velocity or energy propagation argument? If we can do that, it will be very interesting. Let's see. This is how the uh, TTD phi looks at on the phi t plot. That's, a, that's the, the, the cylinder uh, with the axis, time axis on the vertical now. And it so, shows negative and positive slopes. So a negative slope is like a westward flow, movement of the buoyancy. And a positive slope is like an eastward movement. And to my eye, if I look at it carefully enough, I can see some slopes in the plots of UZ as well. But it's very, very qualitative. I mean, it's very difficult to really. So rather than looking at uz, let's look at a different quantity. So let's look at uz dot. This is duz, duz dt. Because we start with the established solution, the flow is already there. It's not a clean periodic box case. So to de detect any disturbance here, we should look at a time derivative of the vertical velocity, rather than looking at vertical velocity itself. So and there are similar slopes here as well. And the magnitude of uh, this duz dt is not so low compared to uh, uz. And I, we think that if you go to an even higher forcing, this will be even closer to uh, the UZ. And that's not surprising because in turbulence, uh, we, work, we come from a turbulence background, so we look at it, things with a turbulence perspective. In turbulence, we say we all often uh, feel that the fluctuations are as strong as the mean. And therefore, the DUZ, DUDT being as strong as UZ is not at all uh, surprising. But it is surprising for the dynamo community, apparently. No one looks at DUDT at all. They just ignore it because it's, it's not there. As if. So what it physically what it denotes is it denotes wave fronts. It denotes the rate of propagation of energy in the vertical. It also denotes the uh, internal motion in some higher frequency waves. So I said there are some some slopes here as well, similar slopes. But of course we need to some do some statistical cross correlation to be you know more conclusive. So then if we do a cross correlation between this plot and this plot, we end up with a plot like this, which shows a peak at zero lag in phi, so it means there's definitely the slopes have, are at same phi location. That's, that's one information we get from the cross correlation. But the cross correlation is not in zero lag in, in time. It is, it, has, it is at some finite, some, some finite time lag. So, so, and this is similar for the other uh, plot as well at a different higher radius. So, and there's a strong asymmetry between negative and positive time lags. So that, what does it mean? So to look at it even more closely, Let's do some more cross correlations at a fixed delta z. So we take a lot of points at a fixed delta z, and then average the cross correlation in z. We can average in, in z. If we do that, it's a much smoother plot. The cross correlation is much smoother. And then if we look at the plot, the same plot at a zero lag in phi, if we just draw a straight line here and plot it here, uh, we see where the peak lies. So this peak lies at a omega t of 26. Is it any meaningful? Does it any, carry any sense? Yes, perhaps. So then if you look at, go back to the group speed argument of inertial waves, that's uh, 2 omega by k. And the k we can get from the spectrum of z vorticity, the most dominant k. And if you replace that k here, we get a approximately uh, omega t time, flight, time of flight of 20, which is not very far from the peak. So it's again a very, very strong hint that the low frequency inertial waves are, yeah, perhaps playing some role. So similarly, we can do uh, this the z t plots. And they are basically straight lines from the, and so this is what the ZT plots look like. This is, again, the quantity is DUDT. And we see some wave-like structures here, so positive and negative slopes. And we can draw some, some straight lines here and find the slopes from these, these plots. And also find the slope from the group speed. And they show a very uh, close comparison. But we have chosen some very specific points here. 
some very so this is a very very subjective analysis to be more objective and statistical we can take we can say we can find several such plots of zt take a fourier transform so a zt plot if you took a fourier transform you get get a omega versus kz plot on a fourier transform and then if you average the fourier transform in z in phi average the fourier transform in phi we get a very nice uh, for concentration of energy in a range minus n plus 2 omega so it was very very remarkable and very surprising i was very happy to find this actually because it shows that uh, the initial waves are quite important in such a fast time scale the the energy content is dominated by the presence of initial waves so the, there's a high energy in the low frequency and this could be also because of some mean flow because because mean flow also has a very low zero frequency but, but it's very hard to separate that that from the tail column type uh, zero frequency modes but it's is very concentrated in focus in minus plus 2 omega that's a very strong hint and this is one of the main results from this particular work we can also plot some straight lines from the, uh, the slopes that we would, we would expect from the most dominant k that is that follows like that so but you can see it's not just one wave number it's definitely a whole range it's a quite a broadband uh, uh, spectrum in some sense so this was uh, most important result and i'll just conclude uh, by saying that we think that the internally driven natural waves they exist in the strongly forced time simulations and we think that they are very important in maintaining the uh, coherence of the columnar structures at very high relative numbers. And there's a very strong uh, qualitative comparison which is, uh, between that image and the image from a vertical slice of UZ in a, in a much simpler setting, uh, which is quite, uh, quite nice. So the question that we are trying to answer now is where does the helicity come from? So it's, it's not as simple as the periodic box case. It's very much difficult because of the spherical boundary, magnetic field, and everything. That's something we are working on now. This is one recent paper where they have shown that the fluctuating velocity, so velocity come from the fluctuating components of velocity and vorticity, that is not near the boundary. And people mostly in the dynamic community think that the velocity comes from the Ekman, Ekman layer. This is now clearly shown that, uh, that they are, everyone has been wrong. And the velocity actually comes from somewhere else. It's close to the inner boundary, but probably it's more, mainly in the bulk, not near the boundary. So it's a very interesting question. And I think we, if we understand where the velocity comes from, we sort of understand uh, where the magnetic field comes from. Let's hope for some uh, good results in the future. So, this is uh, the references. Uh, just thank people from, for their help. I'll leave you with this uh, small cartoon. So thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, geomagnetism uh, variations and other things, no? Yeah, yeah. So Do they see any imprint of this internal dynamics on the density and the spatial distribution of so they, are, they are trying to think in the, those ways. So now they are trying to relate the, the, the they call it secular yeah. variation, the DBTT, the change in magnetic field with time. And they are now try, trying to relate that to the, the underlying the flow. But the thing is, it's very so hard to make any, any guesses about the flow because the thing is, they use the magnetic field to, to infer the flow. So they invert. That's what the other scientists do. So if you use that to infer the flow, and then using that flow to connect that with the uh, circular variation, it's not. Uh, you can get the time scales, the variation, the spatial distribution. Yes, yes. So, so the, yes. So the community is now very interested in in, in waves. Everybody is now uh, interested in short time scale and fast time scale behavior, which is quite new. So this is a very good time to be in dynamo community and doing waves as such. So all sorts of waves. I, I st stuck to the type of waves where there is no magnetic field. Uh, one of the questions that you can ask is what happens if you have a magnetic field and what does it do to the, to the inertial waves at all? So that's a very good question. And it will definitely it will dissipate the waves, it can distort the waves, it can affect the helicity distribution. So there are very good questions and some people like uh, Dr. Binus Srinivasan have been looking at such kind of different kind of waves. And indeed we also have been looking at them. But the thing is to simplify it, we sometimes say, let's say just consider one force at a time and let's see the effect of the dynamics for one, that force. And if we have, then, then we add another force. We add buoyancy. We can even have the inertia gravity waves, some part of the core. Some people are working on that as well. And we have inertia uh, alpha and hybrid waves. So the whole array, a whole range of waves. And in fact, uh, in the core, it's quite possible that a lot of waves super uh, exist together. And they have the overlapping frequencies and wave numbers. So the question is, how do you differentiate that? This is an inertia wave and this is a Initial gravity wave, or this is an alpine wave. It's very, very difficult. Yeah. 
Let me just quickly say. So, so what about nonlinear coupling of these waves? I mean, you ignored them right now, but yes, uh, yes. Do they matter? They could matter in long term. So let's say if we have for us simulation. The Rossby number is very very low, and the core Rossby number is even lower. We have not been able to reduce that regime. So if you look at the Rossby number as a ratio of time scales, the time scale for the nonlinear terms to be important is much much larger for the nonlinear terms. In fact, it's much larger for the even for the magnetic. You mean uh, the linear uh, answers are quite good. That's what one could say here. Uh, linear answers from the linear theory is very good for. For yeah, because the waves uh, are mostly most of the waves that we talk about, they are they are mostly linear, and uh, but. People have been trying to do look at Reynolds test, for example. That's an all-linear thing. So that is also people are looking at it. All right. So the inertial uh, the inertial waves uh, waves are on the time scale of days. Yes. But the time scale for the geodynamo is millions of years. So yes. is there an, you know can you take something from these simulations? Yes. Like an alpha. Uh, yes. Uh, are there approaches which are trying, you know, you, you probably cannot do this for a million years and yes. you know, see reversals and so on. So, is there some sort of, are there approaches to get a subgrid model from such simulations uh -huh. and put in a long, you know, put in the longer term simulations of the full. Uh, so, so, if I get you right, you mean to say that how much of this can be applied for the longer simulations? The answer is that uh, because we know that the columnar flow is could be very important for the geodynamo, and people thought that this columnar flow is is almost static, so the columns are always there. They maybe they move in phi. But if the flow is highly unsteady, then how are the columns always so static, always so always so so coherent? So what we are trying to say is that the inertial waves can maintain that coherence in a very fast time scale. That may not have a direct impact on the uh, geodynamo, but it can have an indirect impact through the formation or coherence of the columnar structures and helical, if they are helical as well. So, but the next thing that we are trying to do now, to now is look at longer time scales and look at whether the contribution of helicity which comes from these waves, can that be important for the helicity which is required for the geodynamo? That's one question we are, we are trying to answer. That is, you can calculate an alpha from these. Yes, yes, and we are also trying to relate that helicity with the alpha, the alpha. Uh, 